You're listening to The State of Work, the podcast by Lano. The State of Work is about finding your place in the changing world of work as an individual or an organization. Each episode, we dive into some of the benefits and limitations we face when it comes to remote and flexible work and take a look at how we work, how we hire and manage people, and how we live in this increasingly global workplace. I'm your host, Maddie Duke, and today's episode is our first in a series focusing on creative industries. I'm joined by film producer Mark Daniel Deschamps in a discussion about the current state of the film industry, online film festivals and networking, making films remotely, and how crucial cinema audiences are to film culture. Don't forget to check the show notes and visit podcast.lano.io for links and further reading. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for joining us on The State of Work. Hi, Maddie. Glad to be here. Could you introduce yourself and let us know what your background is and maybe a little bit about your studio as well? Yeah, I'm a film producer since 15 years now. I produced my first movie when I finished film school in Berlin. And since then, I produced half a dozen movies, feature films. Uh, mostly international co-productions. That's kind of, I ended up in, in working internationally um, and a couple of, of uh, German TV movies. And um, I also worked in distribution. I represented films by Michael Moore on the German market and uh, other independent directors, filmmakers. And now I'm working for a film studio called Shoot and Post. And we are providing post-production services for film productions all around the world. And we also have our own production department, which I'm running. Great. On the state of work, we're talking a lot about remote work. So maybe with that in mind, can you talk about how films are being made at the moment and what aspects of the whole process are being made remotely? Yeah, well, I guess filmmaking is remote work per se because films being shot all over the world and um, most time on original locations, if not in a studio. So the first step of filmmaking is usually you sit down and write a story, a screenplay, and then um, you're building up your team, um, starting with the right actors, casting process, but also finding the right director of photography, yeah, and all the other crew members, production design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, and then it's a traveling circus most times. We're used to work in, in different countries or different cities, um, you know, wherever this story takes place, or we use different studio locations, facilities. And after uh, the film is being shot, um, there is this long, long process of post-production, mm-hmm. um, which happens in a studio like the one I'm sitting right now. And there is the long process of editing. And then you have the process of uh, the sound design, the sound mix. And very often now you have CGI, so computer-generated images. So visual artists are working on creating dinosaurs or dragons or sometimes just, uh, uh, you know, a street in Paris in the 19th century. That is a long process that can take uh, a year or sometimes years <laughs> before the film is being published. And then you have the long period of exhibition. So in the old days, uh, big films were premiered in a cinema. And had the first run in cinemas. And um, that is, I think that's one thing we're going to talk about. That yeah. is a yeah. model that disrupted right now. It was disrupted already before the pandemic. And now, of course, most cinemas in the world are closed. Um, so a lot of films are waiting to be released. Mm-hmm. You know, James yeah. Bond is, uh, you know, hanging out at a martini bar since uh, one and a half years waiting <laughs> for some cinema in the world. Um, you're still waiting, and a lot of films end up being released. Uh, you know, they have their premiere on a video stream platform. But that's the situation today because we are now still in the middle of the pandemic. I hope cinemas will open up soon uh, because I think um, 
a lot of films they still belong as cinemas because there are a lot of films that need an audience that need the community um you know the feeling of of being together with other members of the audience laugh together cry together and um go for a drink after you watch the movie and discuss it and yeah absolutely it's a totally different experience you i know you've mentioned to me that there are kind of two major aspects to film production or filmmaking one is that production side that has historically always been a little bit remote, let's say, because you've got filming on locations, maybe several locations yeah. and then multiple studios involved that could be sit, like located in different countries. So that's not something that's new to people who work in film. But in that exhibition, that sales side and things like trade events and film festivals, can you talk a little bit about how that has been affected by the pandemic yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I i miss film festivals a lot oh and, yeah and i'm sure yeah and, and and the the events um uh, yeah I, I i've visited some festivals in the last month um you know on my on my macbook screen yeah uh, it's all it's all digital and i have to say for me it's not the same and i think for the business it's not the same i mean films are being sold Yep. Uh, we just closed the European film market, which is always the um, first important market of the year um, in Berlin. So that is, you know, the Berlin Film Festival is like the the, uh, the front uh, shop window of the film industry. And in the back for the professionals, there is the European film market. Uh, the next one would have been Cannes Market. And uh, then in autumn, You've got Toronto and the American film market in November. These are the big events where independently made films are being sold to the, all the distributors in the world. And for some kind of films, it is very important to get this event character to be shown in front of an audience. Um, so buyers can get a feeling of, oh, does this really work for an audience? Mm. And then you have, um, often, you know, this, this bidding contest that, that buyers of one, you know, most films are sold per territory. So you have the German speaking territory, which is uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Then you have the Spanish speaking world and you have uh, France and then all the other countries. So most independently made films are being sold per country and uh, the distributor takes all the rights. So from cinema, video stream, TV rights, etc. cetera. Um, so this whole lifespan of a, of a movie. And how do you, how do you choose from this overcrowded market? How do you, how do you pick the film that you want to show to your national audience? There is your own gut feeling that this work for me. Mm -hmm. Do I think there is an audience for it? But it's it's uh, it's with a, made with a purpose that that especially the European film market or the Cannes film market is connected to a film festival, where a lot of those films being sold on a market are also shown to a festival audience. Yeah, because that creates a buzz around a film, and a, lo a lot of films now are not really on the radar of the buyers because there's no audience. And I guess it's also like if you're one of the decision makers, you know, you know, for on behalf of a film distribution company, something might not resonate to you personally, which is fine. You know, not every film is for every type of person. Yeah. But without that ability to screen something in front of an audience that is the relevant audience and seeing their response and the buzz that generates, yeah, you're in a sticky position trying to make that judgment on a possibly also on a laptop screen at home. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure people Absolutely. in the film industry have monitors, but like worst case scenario, yeah, you're making the, the decision, you know, based on a screening that's not the ideal setting without the relevant audience that's bought tickets to the festival to go and see it because it interests them. How do you make that call? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there are legendary stories out there about very, very small films that are were hard enough to get made and then how those films find an international audience. So one example is 
um, it's an old movie, but I think it's still a good example of films such as um, Little Miss Sunshine. You know, everybody knows the film, everybody loves it. It's a very small film. And usually when you read the pitch, does it sound like a international box of a hit? Rather not. So your gut feeling would be, ah, uh, no, rather not. Then this film was shown at Sundance to an audience. And after the first screening, all the distributors, all the big, you know, big studios made a bit. Yep. Based on that audience response. Based just on the audience response of the first screening. You could have watched it on your, on your monitor and you could have thought, okay, it's a nice film. It, uh, it, it really is. It resonates. But it's an audience out there. And I think a lot of uh, distributors would have shied away. Mm -hmm. But after that screening, everybody made a bit. And the film was sold for some. The producers already made a profit without selling one cinema ticket. And we know the rest of the story. The film was very, very profitable. Everybody remembers it. And now, during the pandemic, I'm not sure if Little Miss Sunshine would have made the same buzz would have been sold and very likely nowadays it would be sold to a video streamer directly like netflix amazon prime and and then it would be buried in the algorithm because um, netflix releases those kind of films without putting up a marketing budget so you have to find it and there are success stories also in the world of these um, streaming platforms where the movies suddenly they get an audience they get the word of mouth but it's not the same. It's not yeah, the same. for and, sure. Um, we, we need the audience and we need festivals, we need markets and we need to meet each other. So this kind of digital world doesn't, doesn't work for us, I would say. Is there a way that some festivals are doing, I think it was the Human Rights Film Festival last year where I, I watched a couple of the movies online. But of course, you know, there was no collection of response data you know what i mean as a as a viewer yeah. i wasn't asked yeah. for my response and i you know i think there's definitely an opportunity for some festivals who've had to go online to capture some of the audience response and i'm sure some of them do are you able to speak a little bit to that like are you aware of what some festivals have done to kind of bridge that gap and and make an effort to try to get a good snapshot of audience sentiment yeah, they, they make efforts, and and um, I'm, I'm I'm not saying that it's it's um, totally responsible. So I I visited the co-production market in Tallinn in uh, November, which was fully digital, of course. I didn't go to Tallinn, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I I met a lot of uh, fellow producers online, like you know the way we talk now. Yep, and it was nice. But not the same because what what I what I think is it is possible to sustain an already established contact online via Zoom meetings and and calls and email exchange. It is very difficult to build up new relationships because there is all you know there is uh, this chemical process when you meet new people that is missing. And also this random talk that, you know, you have the official meeting and at a festival, usually uh, the real bonding happens after the official part, you know, yeah. at the hotel bar or, exactly. uh, you know, you're doing a movie together, whatever. So at the moment, I think we, we all work hard to sustain our already established contacts. We make a couple of new contacts and, and um, the co-production markets and the festivals, they make a big effort to keep everything alive. Um, but I think we're all hungry to one day meet again in person. But of course, we are grateful that we have the, the instrument, the tools right now to keep the, the fire burning a little bit. Mm -hmm. Can you expand a little bit on that? What are some of the tools or technologies that, that you've seen embraced by the industry to support work in film? The Tallinn Festival, uh, the Black Knights Festival, and there's a co-production market, they have their own platform. And you can ask for meetings with people you're interested in. And so it's a matchmaking platform. Mm -hmm. And and then they had their own video platform where you could meet. And it's very nice. It's very efficient. And then later you have the exchange of, of documents. And what they also provided, and that was very nice, 
they provided a video platform. So you could prepare a meeting, you, you met a producer and, and the director, and the previous work of the director were available on that video platform. So you had all the resources there. Absolutely. You didn't have to leave the meeting and, and ask for, or oh, could you send me a screener? You already had the chance to prepare for the meeting by um, you know, having a look at, at the previous work of, of the uh, respective director or producer. Um, that was very nice. Of course, there are advantages. I mean, I, I save travel time, I save money, and um, I drink less alcohol. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's not a substitute. Do you think that this then also makes film festivals and events more accessible for new pe like people that are new to the market with new films and small budgets that might not have otherwise been able to travel to attend a film festival is that something that's happening that it's opening it up to to a more diverse yeah. production market uh that is a good question i have no answer for um usually a film needs a sales company that is putting this film on the marketplace. I mean, we were used to watch, we call it screeners, so um, that is the sample of the film or the whole film. We already watched most of the films in our offices online because you weren't able to jump from one screening to the other. Yeah. But sometimes there were films that, you know, okay, that is a film I'm really interested. I want to watch it on a, on a big screen. So at the European film market, for example, there are a lot of small cinemas where you can watch a movie on a screen, not with a real audience, but with a professional audience. So all the other buyers. <laughs> so you could see which other, um, you know, when you have a competitor, you can, you, you, you meet your competitors in the screening room. And when you see the, somebody is leaving, you don't know. Is he or she leaving because they want to make a bid on the movie? Yeah, it's like a, a poker face situation. Like, are they <laughs> trying to throw you off on purpose? Right. And now we are kind of um, eBaying uh, films. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you don't know uh, uh, if your competitors are, are waiting in the line and, and are making the same bid on the same movie or not. Um, are there more smaller films on the marketplace? I guess not, because I think you still need a sales company buyers want a sales company behind a movie because that is the first proof that the movie might have some market value. And I think because everybody is so insecure about the future at the moment, less titles get bought. And then you want to make sure that the title you buy is really finding an audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People are being a bit more cautious, maybe. Yeah. And of course, there are so many films on shelves right now waiting to be released um, because some distributors, they wait for cinemas to open up again. Not only James Bond is waiting, <laughs> also a lot of small independent movies. They don't want to be uh, wasted or being released straight on, on Netflix and Amazon because it's got disadvantages there. I mean, when you're hidden in the algorithm, then you don't know, exist. Do you think that some filmmakers might be starting to, or maybe this is already happening, starting to make films with the knowledge or awareness that they're likely to be seen more on laptop screens rather than yeah, on big screens? Sure. Like a, does that change the way people actually film? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that started already before the pandemic. Of course, you have, um, not, not, not every film is suited for cinema. Cinema is always a special event, so that are film stories bigger than life stories, controversial or comedy or action, you know. Um, and then there are small stories um, that are very suitable for a small screen. Um, I mean, I produced a film two years ago that was made to go straight to YouTube, actually. Oh, okay. Because it was a story suited for YouTube because it was a film... Um, it's a film about two young women, and the film is like a, a, a mock-up documentary, like the two women film each other and their life story. And so it could have been made by a 16, 17-year-old uh, young woman and being put up on YouTube. And it's a professionally made film, professionally produced, financed and everything, made for a YouTube platform. Um, run by public broadcaster that's how we got the, the budget and, and uh, 
we didn't have to sell the movie. So it was kind of financed by, by a public broadcaster. Did it play into that whole trend of, of digital creators and, and YouTubers in general? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Would you like to tell us what it's called so people can check it out? It's called Wach. Wach, okay. Wach is uh, German for awake. And because the storyline is it's a self-experiment of these two young women, they want to keep each other awake as long as possible. Ah. Rule number one, without drugs. Okay. <laughs> we'll pop that into our show notes. It, yes. It resonated very well with the young audience because yeah. they they really felt connected to the young, to the characters, to the main characters, these young uh, women. Mm -hmm. They thought, I could have made this movie. Uh, and it was a very emotional story. And for me, the interesting part um, was it's like attending the first screening at a festival where you feel the audience, does it work or is the audience annoyed or bored or excited about the movie? And of course, you know, on digital platform, you, you're not with the audience, but then on YouTube, you have the commentaries. Yes. And we had, it's already started, you know, the film was just, an hour on the platform and we already had hundreds of comments and, and they were so uh, emotional that we already knew, okay, yes, the film is working and there is an audience out there and they're watching it and they feel something, they are interested, they are engaged. That was a great feedback. I loved it. Um, it's, it's really a conversation between young people about their life. That's the best thing a movie can do. And uh, that was a great experience. Uh, I mean, we can be grateful that we have a public broadcaster and we don't have to sell this movie. Otherwise, of course, uh, it wouldn't be a business model. Um, it's interesting because I think obviously a good skill for decision makers in this industry to have to be able to empathize with different storylines and experiences because it really depends who's in that seat, you know, like who's personally connecting to the story and that ability yeah. to go, okay, I don't personally connect to it, but of course there are young women in this world who might yeah. connect to this. And then looking at where, where do they access, you know, film and TV? Are they the type of people you can kind of go even further into it and go, who goes to the cinema? Like forget COVID yeah. for a second and just go, yeah. Yes, we, we know there's an audience for this. Does that audience go to the cinema? Um, yeah, well, I think YouTube was the right platform for Bach because we, we always knew that it wasn't suited for cinema. It's a very intimate story. And that's the opposite to a movie like um, Little Miss Sunshine, which is a comedy, a tragic comedy, but yeah. comedy you want to have for laugh. And uh, Wach is a very intimate story, and I think you feel more comfortable to watch it alone. And then, and then you have the exchange with um, other viewers, but but also a kind of uh, anonymous uh, exchange. Um, uh, so I don't want to give away too much of the story in case people want to watch it. Uh, but the story leaves you a bit unsettled, and you have questions about yourself, your life. And then you can have this exchange with totally strangers, which is sometimes much more intimate than an exchange with good friends. And for that reason, that was totally right platform. And I still love that we have made the decision to produce a movie for, for you. YouTube, a professional -made movie for YouTube. Yeah. The State of Work is brought to you by Lano, providing businesses with all the tools they need to compliantly onboard, manage and pay international employees and contractors. Lano also provides a free all-in-one tool for freelancers, including filmmakers, to manage clients, send invoices and get paid on time, every time. Find out more at lano.io. While we are talking about films that you've been involved in, one of your films, In Darkness, was Oscar nominated, and congratulations! I'd love, I'd love to hear about well how it was made and and whether there were aspects to it that were remote and and what some of the challenges were there. Oh, that was really um, yeah, that was my first internationally made movie, internationally financed and and also produced. Great success story, but with um, a lot of trouble in between. Okay. <laughs> uh, it took years to get made, to, to get financed, and then to get made. 
Um, but it's a classic example of how independent films are being financed and are being made for a certain kind of movies and for a certain budget size, you need international partners. So you can't finance a, a certain budget um, out of a country such as uh, Germany alone because there wouldn't be an, an audience alone in, in, in Germany. So immediately you've got a distributed team of people, basically. Yes, you need it to make sure the film is being released in a couple of countries at least and being financed by a couple of countries. So you, you put your audience number together and, and, and your craft. So In Darkness was a co-production between Canada, Poland and Germany, which is kind of naturally based on the story because it's a story that uh, took place in um, at the time it was Eastern Poland. Now it's Ukraine in the city of Lwów. And um, it's during World War II. It's a story about Holocaust survivors. And the script came from Canada. There was a guy, David Shamoon, who found the story in some side notes in a book about um, Holocaust survivors and about those righteous people who helped other people survive. And there was this very unlikely hero, a Polish guy, who was a, a crook. He was a, a thief, a burglar, and uh, he, his day job, um, he was a uh, sewer worker. And he met this uh, group of, of people in the sewers. They were a Jewish family trying to not escape the ghetto. They knew they couldn't escape. They were uh, trying to find a hiding place in the sewers and to survive the war. It's a real story that happened. We met survivors. I, I met family members, children, but also an actual actual uh, survivor, a woman who was seven years old when it happened. So David wrote the script. He never wrote a script before. He came from marketing, but he was so <laughs> so engaged, attracted by the story, he thought, okay, um, I have to try it. And he found producers and those Canadian producers, and they knew, okay, it's a European, it, it has to be a European production in a way. So they were looking out for partners. They went to the American film market where uh, people from the independent film work meet and uh, try to find partners for films um, to be made. So that's where we met. And then we were together looking for a Polish partner and we were looking for a director. And it was obvious that it's it's not going to be a cheap film. It's not going to be totally low budget. Um, also, but also the film, the story is very dark. So it's not also not entertaining blockbuster. It's still a film for a, for a certain niche. And so we approached Anieszka Holland, very renowned Polish filmmaker. She's already been nominated for Oscars two times at that time. And at that time, she was working a lot for HBO, TV shows um, such as Treme and The Wire. And she had a long history of art house films, European art house films, but um, also North American films. Yeah, we had to convince her more than one time to go back to the um, subject of the Holocaust. And yeah... Um, Luckily, we were able to, to work with her and um, we made this movie and it was filmed in Studio Babelsberg, so um, Berlin, and on location in Leipzig and on three locations in Poland. So we were really a traveling circus that was based on the financing of the movie because we had a couple of regional funds in Germany and we had also regional funds in Poland. And when you get money from a regional fund, they expect you to work there, of course. And so it was not based on that we needed a certain location there or that it was suitable or efficient. No, it was uh, the, the filming followed the money. But we had great support in those regions and we found great locations. So it was really worth it. Also, this whole traveling circus that we were. Yeah. And then the post-production part, again, was divided between... Uh, the picture post-production in Germany and the whole sound post-production in Toronto, Canada. So we always had to provide our guys in Canada with uh, the new picture editing so that we're able to continue with the sound design, the sound editing. And of course, we already used the internet 
sometimes because at the time it was 2012 um often the internet was too slow <laughs> we had to send hard disk oh, okay yeah and then we got uh hard disk back and then we could hear oh yeah it sounds good so and and in the end in berlin uh we all put it all together and suddenly we had a movie <laughs> Well, I'm glad that it got, you know, the recognition it deserved as well in the end. Yeah, that we had our premiere in Toronto then at the at the uh, uh, film festival in Toronto, and that was amazing. The, the festival gave us a, a very, very nice date, and we were so glad that we could have one of the film's protagonists there. She was seven year old, seven year old girl when uh, she had to to uh, endure. Uh, I mean, she lived wow. one and a half years in a, in a sewer before they were liberated and the war was over and and uh, she was very grateful to this uh, man who helped them survive and well the screening i was mostly afraid of what's the screening for her her name is christina and we rented a, a cinema in new york she, she lives in new york now and i i wasn't able to travel and our canadian partners were there and we waited we desperately waited for the phone call um how she how she experienced, how she liked the movie, and and if she likes the movie, it was her story, and she met her, uh, um, you know, on screen. She met, kind of she met her parents and her deceased brother and all the people she she uh, lived through this hell there at the time. And then came the phone call, and they said she liked it, and of course she cried, and but she liked it, and she was very grateful. And then we invited her to the premiere in Toronto, and she said, yeah, of course I come, of course. And she brought her son and her husband. And, and then she came on stage when the movie was shown to the audience, and we got standing ovations. And that was one of my greatest moments as a filmmaker and producer yeah. to get this uh, recognition by, by an audience. Well, yeah, again, congratulations, because it's a huge achievement. Yes, and again, it shows how, how, how important festivals are, you know, how important it is have an audience to feel the audience and um yeah we sold the film worldwide and we, we didn't go bankrupt and uh always good um, and i and we were able to get christina a ticket for the oscar ceremony good well it's, it's also really nice to hear that you made sure to take care of the person who was most maybe most emotionally connected to the story oh it's a huge responsibility when you tell real life stories especially about people who are still alive or or have family members who are still alive. It's a big responsibility because you can't tell a story one to one how it really happened. You know, you have to. It's storytelling. You you have to condense things. You you, you know, you have to change a lot of things. Um, sometimes you have to dramatize things also for the effect. And um, we didn't do that much because that story was dramatic enough by itself. But sometimes you have to do it. Then it's a huge responsibility. Is in darkness um, available to watch? Yeah, sure anywhere at the moment sure yeah. it's it's available worldwide it wasn't a big blockbuster but it found its niche and you can download it from itunes amazon prime it's it's there um i went i went to a dvd shop two years ago in australia <laughs> and just you know out of curiosity and vanity searched through the um international films the the, the blu-ray section and I, I found the movie uh, for special price. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I bought five copies. <laughs> um, so do you have any other examples of how Shoot and Post is involved in producing aspects of film on a remote basis? Well, at the moment, as we're still in the middle of a pandemic, the... The film business is very vulnerable. We talked about a lot about the exhibition side. Um, the production side is very much affected by the pandemic itself. So we as a post-production studio, we have a huge responsibility to take care of our staff members and of our clients. For example, we've got actors coming in and out of the studio because they have to do voice recordings here those actors have to go back to a set. So all these rules of social distancing, of hygiene, we have to apply very carefully because for us it would be a huge damage if anybody would get infected here. I mean, in the end, maybe you can't always avoid it, but we do what we can do 
to keep our people safe. Usually when actors come in and, 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 and they do the voice recording, voice recording means that sometimes the sound from the set is not good enough to be used later in the post-production process. So they have to speak the lines again and then they get dubbed. Or the director wants to have some changes in the, in the text. And so the actors come in here and usually very often in the old days, the director was with them because... They need to direct. Yeah. They need to direct. So now we got the director most times on a screen. Okay. The way we talk right now. And yeah. then the director who sits in their office somewhere or sits in a van at the set, you know, mm -hmm. they want to hear what we record and they want to see it, you know, synced with the image to prove that it's really lip sync and, and it's really working for the scene. So we're using a software that also transmits the the image that we see in the studio. So the image of the the original film in it where the, the director is speaking the lines, the actor is speaking the lines on. So the director can follow it. They they can see the same screen too. And then we have the second screen where the director can communicate with the actor also face by yeah. face. Okay. This has become quite common and I think this will also this will be also something that will survive the pandemic because that is very comfortable. It reduces travel time, travel cost. The director can keep on working on set or in the editing suite wherever they are. This is something that works very well and it helps us keep on working and keep the people safe. Um, you know, helps social distancing. So we try we try to have not too many people around here. So also a lot of our sound designers, they work from home right now. That's, yeah, quite a bit to adapt to, even as an industry that's that was already dealing with remote work. There's still changes that you're having to adapt to now. Yeah, I, the good thing is we, we were we were used to, re, to work remotely because of our international corporations, of this traveling circus that a film set is. And also the the division of of works in the in the post production process, yeah, uh, which is also part of of our international financing schemes. You know, it, uh, when you have a big show such as Game of Thrones, uh, they used to work. Also, the the visual effects artists. You have visual effects artists working in Australia and creating the dragon, and then you have the other team working in Berlin uh, on the the background image, the sky or the um, skyline of an ancient city. So that is something that's already been established before. Um, we work in international teams and, and I think that helps us also keep on working. I think uh, in that sense, we, we are kind of blessed that we have those tools. The film business is keeping on working through all the pandemic. So the production part is the distribution part is more affected. I mean, lucky for the rest of us, isn't it? Because with everyone spending so much more time at home, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure the demand for film and TV has increased, you know, so it has to keep up. <laughs> it has. And, and, and also we're waiting for a couple of great films to be released when the cinemas open again. And, and uh, yeah, but of course, um, we produce a lot for streaming services right now. And, uh, and there is there is a huge demand. And also in times of crisis, it's not only because people have time, it's also people are hungry for stories. Yeah, and to escape a bit maybe, yeah. Escape or, or it's it's also time where you, you know, reflect things about life more. Yeah. It's, I, mean, I mean, this pandemic is, it's, it's, you know, it's all about solidarity. And yeah, there is a lot of introspection these days and storytelling helps. And also it helps to watch a comedy sometimes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I think that could be a, a nice place to leave things. Are there any final thoughts you have about film industry and or the future of the film industry? I'm, I'm, no, I'm very curious. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not desperate. I think there are new possibilities and um, we were forced to be creative, not only in what kind of films we are making, but also how we are working together. And um, maybe we also have a new sense for how important other people are. And I hope this kind of, uh, yeah, I, I hope this also creates a new kind of solidarity, kindness with each other. 
and cooperative spirit. Um, we are world connected. We want to be connected and we have to treat each other well and we want to experience each other and not um, just sitting alone in our homes and, and uh, as much as this is enjoyable sometimes too but uh, yeah it's time that it's over so yes yeah well thank you again so much for taking part in this discussion it's been really really interesting to talk about film and just a, a totally different industry to what some of our listeners might be used to. Thanks for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed the episode and if you're in a position to get out and support your local cinema or film festival, please do and keep an eye out for the next in our series on creative industries. The State of Work is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Find us on Instagram or Twitter by searching for The State of Work. We'd love to hear from you. Join the conversation by using the hashtag The State of Work and be sure to check out our show notes at podcast.lano.io for more information on anything we talked about in this episode. Thanks for listening and see you next time on The State of Work.